Hello everyone, good morning. Um, my name is John C. Patel um, and I'm studying psychology and biology in the College of Arts and Sciences. And before I start, I just wanna say a very special thank you to my advisor, Dr. Mercurio, who's sitting in the back. Thank you so much for all of your support um, during this project. So let's dive in. So endometriosis is a disease in which tissue that normally grows inside of the uterus also grows outside of the uterus. As you can see, oh, there. <laughs> And there. Um, when left untreated, this tissue can actually spread to other areas, such as the ovaries themselves, the bladder, or the digestive tract. And this buildup of tissue can cause a chronic inflammatory response for affected individuals. Um, common symptoms that we see in these individuals are extreme pelvic pain, issues with, with menstruation, such as heavy bleeding, and infertility. So endometriosis affects over 10% of females across the globe, and it also still has no cure. So tr treatments usually try to reduce pain rather than actually target the disease, disease itself to solve the problem. The most effective treatment at the moment is laparoscopic surgery. However, laparoscopic surgery is both um, invasive and expensive. So um, many women who do have laparoscopic surgery are experiencing that challenge. In addition, for women who do have laparoscopic surgery, um, they experience both a regrowth of the tissue and a return of symptoms within the next five years. So it's actually not all that effective. Um, additionally, laparoscopic surgery is actually necessary for official endometriosis diagnosis. So there is a barrier to treatment for many young women. This means that there is a stark need for more offered treatment options for endometriosis and a specific emphasis needs to be placed on treating the mental symptoms associated with the disease as well as the physical symptoms. It has been proven that physical and mental pain are connected. So some of the same neural pathways that work to experience physical pain are actually also activated when experiencing mental pain. For individuals with endometriosis, it has been proven that this connection between mental and physical pain does exist. However, not much work has actually been done in order to address the mental symptoms that endometriosis patients suffer from. So when beginning this project, I wanted to answer the following three questions. Number one, what current treatment options do work for people with endometriosis? Number two, how accessible are these treatment options for all patients? And number three, do patients with endometriosis feel that they are being fully supported by their medical staff and community? So I asked these questions with the ultimate goal of producing some kind of integrated treatment option that would attend to both mental and physical symptoms and would allow for patients to utilize this method on their own throughout their life so that they could eventually manage their pain on their own, given that the disease is incurable. So I employed a two-part structure for my project. I first distributed an online survey through Qualtrics and then also gave participants the option of completing a 10-minute Zoom interview with me um, so that I could ask more specific and targeted questions. It was really important to me that I was able to get the patient's perspective instead of the perspective of the medical community because when I was doing my preliminary research, it had become abundantly clear to me that the actual experiences of patients living with endometriosis are still under, underrepresented in the scientific community. So my survey included three measures to assess mental symptoms of endometriosis. The first was the CESD, which measure, measures depressive symptoms. The STAI measures symptoms of anxiety. And the QOLS measures overall quality of life. Um, all three measures were structured with Likert scale responses, which just means participants answered for each statement whether they felt it was least true or most true for them. So for the CESD and the STAI, higher scores are actually negative and they indicate higher levels of depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms respectively. For the QOLS, higher scores are positive and indicate a better quality of life. The results of all three measures indicate poor mental health for women suffering from endometriosis. So this is a lot of numbers, let's break this down. So for the CESD, scores can range from zero to 60. Scores can be assigned to one of three categories, no depressive symptoms, moderate depressive symptoms, or severe depressive symptoms. The lower cutoff for consideration for clinical depression is 16, and the average score for my participants was 28.11. Additionally, 56% of my participants scored in the severely depressed category. For the STAI, scores can range from 20 to 80. Um, scores can be assigned, again, to one of three categories, no anxiety, moderate anxiety symptoms, or severe anxiety symptoms. Um, the lower cutoff for scores indicating consideration for clinical anxiety is 38. 
and the average score for my participants was 47.62. Furthermore, 46% of my participants scored in the high anxiety category. For the QOLS, scores can range from 16 to 112. The national average score for the QOLS is 90, um, which is statistically significantly higher than the average score for my participants, which was 70.45. Also, studies have been conducted on other groups with other chronic diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and psoriasis, and the average national scores for all of these groups are in the 80s, whereas, again, the average score for my participants was 70.45. So all of these statistics obviously indicate that individuals with endometriosis experience significant decline in mental health, and it emphasizes the need for treatments which address mental sy symptoms that are clearly associated with the disease. Furthermore, during interviews with my participants, I learned that patients with endometriosis do not feel supported by the medical community. What you're seeing on the screen now are the responses that I received from my participants when I asked them the following question. If you could tell medical professionals who work with endometriosis patients one thing, what would you say? So as you can see, when endometriosis patients are talking to their doctors, their concerns regarding their mental health and the severity of their pain are ignored. It also seems from what I have learned directly from endometriosis patients that gynecologists are not educated well enough about the disease. Given the high rates of individuals affected with endometriosis, doctors should have a better understanding of all of the symptoms associated with the disease and should be both ready and willing to treat these symptoms. Overall, a larger awareness of endometriosis and its symptoms is necessary in order to fully address all aspects of the disease through treatment. Furthermore, from listening to patients with endometriosis, I have learned that endometriosis specialists are actually better at both diagnosing and assessing and addressing the symptoms of endometriosis. As such, in my final paper, I'm emphasizing the need for endometriosis specialists and specialized medical staff so that they can fully treat endometriosis and all of its symptoms. Furthermore, the list that you see here underneath mental health treatment integration um, are the treatments which my participants actually told me do work to an extent to treat endometriosis. However, none of these treatment options were directly recommended to my patients by their doctors. Rather, these were treatments that they found either through other women with endometriosis or just tried on their own. And doctors need to specifically be addressing these mental health treatment integrations. Given that we know endometriosis has significant mental health effects, I'm recommending in my final paper that gynecologists and endometriosis specialists have specific psychotherapists that they are ready to recommend as a part of endometriosis treatment. I'm also specifically emphasizing the need for pelvic floor therapy, as this is a tool which endometriosis patients can learn with medical staff and then go and take with them through the rest of their life in order to manage their pain on their own. Overall, I will use my paper to recommend more mental health treatment integration in endometriosis treatment and will try to raise awareness about the necessity of holistic treatment for this disease. Thank you. We will now be beginning our Q&A session. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will bring this microphone to you. Um, so basically when I was thinking about my Keystone project, so as I mentioned, I study psychology and biology, so I wanted to make some kind of connection between the two, um, and I wanted to study how mental health does affect physical health. Um, endometriosis is um, something I kind of landed on when doing research with my advisor, and it pretty much clicked straight away when I was researching it. Um, Personally, like, this is a very important topic to me. Women's health is really underrepresented in the scientific community, and so that's why I picked endometriosis. I can't tell. Oh, yeah? Okay, my bad. Uh, when it comes to finding your patients, like, did you go to a clinic, or, or did you find, uh, like, I don't know, partner up with some organization to, to get people to do your survey? Yeah, great question. So I, um, I made a bunch of like online digital flyers, basically. Also, participants were compensated. I didn't discuss this, but I think that was an incentive for people when they saw the flyer. Um, but I basically emailed a bunch of gynecologist offices um, and had them post their flyer either on social media or like print it out and post it in their office. Um, and I also joined a bunch of endometriosis support Facebook groups and posted my flyer myself there, too.
Hey, uh -huh. fantastic presentation. I loved it. I think it was so great. And I also was wondering if you, uh, you talked a little bit about just like the difficulty in getting like an endometrious diagnosis or just having patients believe be believed by their doctors. Do you know what the typical age range is, is when people first would receive their endometrious diagnosis or what would, what's kind of the span of that? Yeah, that's also a great question. Um, so just for context, my participants range between 21 and 57. Um, um, 21, I didn't like make that one of the stipulations. It just happens to be that way because diagnos diagnosis does tend to happen so late. Um, one of my interview questions was around that topic and the average time between presentation of symptoms and diagnosis is 12 years, which is insane. Um, and the, one of the barriers to that is the fact that you do need to get that laparoscopic surgery in order to be diagnosed. So many young women in their teens and 20s are undiagnosed with endometriosis and often don't get diagnosed until they've had their first child. Any correlation between the gender of the physician, the patient, and diagnosis? I did not study um, the gender of the physician in this particular study, but that would be a great, yeah. I don't have that answer, sorry. Time for one more question. Um, were there any challenges you ran into throughout this process of collecting the data and reviewing it, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so I think my biggest challenge was getting participants um, because, again, this like disease is so underrepresented in the scientific community. Um, but I think, again, like the participant compensation, it was like a great incentive, but I learned from women who were doing the interview with me that that actually wasn't the biggest incentive. Um, people were just really excited to see someone doing a study on this um, and actually told me, some of my participants were like, I didn't even care, like I didn't even know I was gonna get compensated. Like I just really wanted to like put this information out there. But I think that the biggest uh, barrier was like getting my flyer out to the right people and having the right people see it. But once it happened, it was, it was good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>